Welcome everyone! For the ones of you who don't know me, my name is Alan Zucconi, I'm a lecturer in artificial intelligence and a science communicator. And if this is the first time you're watching, a warm welcome to Game Dev Graveyard. This is the weekly show where we talk about games, projects, prototypes, post-mortems, all the kind of stuff that is related to game development and to the sort of realm of making, uh, making, making the game, the game happens. As you probably know, as I'm saying, you know, for the past few weeks, a lot is happening right now in the world. Uh, you all have, you know, responsibility to be informed about what's happening, but it's also a lot to take. So if you just want to spend one hour, maybe two hours, we'll see how long it lasts for just chatting and talking about video games and nothing else, then perhaps, you know, this is the right place if that's the kind of stuff that, um, that you like. Now, um, with that, with that being said, um, as always, um, if you want to interact with me or with a guest, feel free to write a comment. Oh, where is it? <laughs> uh, comments uh, in the chat, and I will um, I will try to reply to all of them, you know, as, as fast as we can, possibly. Um, and if there is any problem with the audio, or you can't hear me, or you can't hear the guest, just let me know, and maybe maybe we can fix it live. So, with that being said, I just want to. Uh, introduce um, Jai Bernag, is the creative director and co-founder of Finifugo Games and he's also the lead designer for Too Many Cooks. It's a really, really nice mobile game that I had the chance to see being developed, or at least, you know, seeing how we evolve over uh, a bit of its, of its development. And Jai has also worked on a variety of other different projects and I'm more than happy to have him tonight so we can, we can talk about them and see how his design process works. Now, with that being said, I think, you know, it's time to introduce Jai. Hi, Jai, how are you doing? Hi, Alan. Hi, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm Jai Bonag. I am, uh, like Alan said, creative director at Finifugu Games. It was very fortunate that, like, kind of like our first game at Finifugu was a game that Alan was kind of there in the background. <laughs> we were stealing his students to test the game from the very beginning, and he really saw it go from, like, day one right up to graduation. Um, and now, of course, the project is a lot bigger than that. But so it's really cool to come back and like talk about the game with Alan. And of, all, of course, talk about what else that game has allowed us to do now that we're like, I guess we're professional game developers now. So yeah. And you know, you mentioned that I had a chance to see the game evolving. And you know, to me, that's so amazing because like there's nothing better for me personally as a lecturer to see the students starting from students and managing you know to to get a name from themselves managing to get stuff done managing to you know to become successful developers i think that that's really the essence of what what we're trying to do so um you know not taking any credits of course but being able to see <laughs> i wish <laughs> being able to see that journey i think it's it's really rewarding you know so there's always there's always uh, the, the intention to help students. So I think that in your case, yeah. David and I, David has been one of my previous guests, uh, David King. Uh, you know, seeing yes. how much you progressed in your career, I think has been you know an absolute highlight for for my time uh, at LCC. Now, with that um, with that being said, do you want to introduce a bit yourself, your background, what do you do? Yeah. Um... So I'm, uh, I'm originally from Thailand. I've been there most of my life. Um, so I'm one of the very few like Thai games developers that I know. And I originally went to school uh, for my undergraduate in architecture. I believe I'm not the first one on this show who started off in architecture. I know there's quite a few of us around the indie games community um, who've converted over. And towards the end of my architecture career, I realized that real life wasn't quite enough. And so I started moving into virtual spaces and so, you know, I think we're going to talk about Tsenda and some of my early projects were, were much more architectural and much more spatial. But now I've completely left it behind. I'm completely into 2D UI based games now. The sense of space is totally gone. But I still feel like the presence of architecture in the base of my work, which is it's it's fun to think that I, I consider it a continuation of my practice. So. Um, yeah, I came to London to finish my a master's in games design 
where I met Alan, I met David, and uh, I met my business partner, Chris Lee, who was um, in Alan's year. And when he, for the final project, um, we got together, we had worked with a, lot, a bunch of other people and we had decided, heck, you know, it's the last project. We haven't worked with each other yet. Let's just give it a shot. And we made too many Cokes and within like a, it was like a one day to one week thing. And then we, we were thinking, yeah, this works. And then, you know, we've been together ever since. And it, and it really, does really... work. And I'm, I'm sure we will have a chance to talk about it later. And trust me, it does work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I meant like me and Chris, like we worked. Like, um, I know that finding like a good, like developing partner is really, really hard sometimes. And it's like, um, and we weren't even friends. We just clicked working wise uh so now we're good friends so <laughs> it's really weird how that but out. that's also something that for example um both at lcc where i work before and got me to where i work now we really try to do so having students working with each other even on different oh. projects just because that's how it works in the game industry you find cool people you want to work with you click like um you know creatively and you take it from there so we we, we you know we think it's the, the best collaboration happens like this in a way. So we try to give all this the chances to people to sort of play test each other's games, even from different years, from different courses. I think it's what mm -hmm. really, um, really adds a lot of value to the students, this kind of experience, not just making their own things, but being able to yeah. collaborate. I mean, if I can like interject on that, I, I think that especially for education, um, especially for games, one of the most valuable things you're paying for when you go to university is the selection of students that you get the other people that you're going to meet there. Cause like nowadays, you know, there's so many online courses and stuff. If you really wanted to teach yourself something, you can go to tutorials like Alan's and like other ones online. You can really teach yourself a lot, but you might not meet the person that will make your work kind of like go further. And I feel like, so of course, got to get them to work together. Otherwise they're missing out on like, the main thing that I, the main value, I think, of school. Definitely. So um, I have a first proper question for you. And it's one that, you know, in all the years that I've been, uh, I've been knowing you, I actually didn't have a chance to, to, to ask you, basically. So <laughs> what does Finifugu mean? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so we've done this quite a few times. I'm like a sickler for um, etymologies. Hopefully I still have this right. So Finifugu is, comes from the English word Finifugal. Finifugo, I think it's like the first part of it is fini, as in like Finnish, but it basically means people who avoid the ending to a story. So, you know, like in that sense, it's the way we're taking it is like, you know, we won't stop working, we won't give up, like we'll continue because we don't want to see an ending to something. So that's Finifugo. And the original name of the company is Finifugu and Friends with a double and. And I think for the programmers out there, of course, double and means that it's like, it's part of the part of the script, which is like this and this. And the way we always saw it was, um, you know, Finifugu and it's like a featuring sign, Finifugu and something, Finifugu and someone else. Um, and that's how the early bit of the the early projects really went. It was like Finifugu and my early projects were very much featuring other people. So um, it represent. I think Finifugu and friends kind of represents like the whole collaborative stance that. Um, of like the way that we started off with um, making things. And that's why the logo you see is like a double and symbol kind of like put together. So yeah, Finifugu and Friends, the original name. That's actually, that's actually quite nice. I, I didn't know that. Um, and I was actually, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a good programmer. I actually w was wondering why is the double and sign? <laughs> but now it makes sense. Now it actually makes sense. Whenever like writing it for the business stuff they're always like do you mean a single and i'm like no 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 i mean it's not a typo <laughs> but it, it it i think it's nice i think it's really nice so um one of the so basically i remember the first day we met uh david king invited me to um lcc i wasn't working there yet and maybe that's how i started sort of working there and it just needed me for playtesting and a few other folks just to do some playtesting. Oh, was that the first day? <laughs> oh, I think I, I think I remember. And I well, for remember. me, it was the first. I think the first day we proper met, I guess. And I remember yeah. that um, you were like on a corridor and on a table you were showing your games. And I've been seeing games all day. And you know, yeah. especially when you make games like in a game jam, you don't expect yeah. to see stuff that it's you know well crafted you expect stuff that is barely put together oh. right and i remember yeah. like with the corner of my eyes i saw i see shaders what is this <laughs> and oh yeah i remember 
I remember very clearly. And I was absolutely like uh, taken by by basically what what I had seen. So do you want to talk a bit about um, Tassenda? Yes, um, of course. So Tassenda, which is again like it's the same time as I made the name Finifugu. So Tassenda is also like an like a word that means like in English words better off left unsaid. And um, this was my final project, which I didn't start in the final. I actually started off like from the very beginning of the school course, but I had worked on it continuously through the year. And it's a project that was very reactionary to London. Um, I don't remember my perfect pitch for Tosenda, but um, it's basically a project where I took stories from the BBC Listening Arc, uh, Channel 4's Listening Project, and I turned them into characters and I put them on an imaginary digital train um, where the passenger who would be playing like during their commute would drop in and out of these uh, train rides to listen to these stories of people. And it's the, the point is that it's kind of like the afterlife. You listen to these stories of real people with real cadences and real like weight behind them. And then they get released into the afterlife and they, you know, they disappear. And the range of stories really differs. We allow everything. There was like, children talking about like parent suicide there's like um people talking about what christmas means to them there's like an old lady regretting that she stopped riding the bicycle um we kind of put all these stories together and the um, i think the real strength of it was that we we tried to find a repurposed uh use or me and my team found a repurposed use for archived um audio files and these audio files were coming into the british library at that time um but I think the strength of it was um, that when you listen to it, they weren't artificial stories. They were real stories with real weight behind them. And you could hear the weight behind people's words. And I think that's why we got a lot of uh, emotional reactions from like our audiences and stuff. And I think that was really supportive for me as like an early games developer um, to see to see like a train space, which in, at that time was like a very architectural train space become a very social experience for me and my audiences in a way that my previous work never was able to connect to other people so yeah archived projects lots of shaders a lot of like emotional stories put into a place um i got to work with a really nice team uh that lcc had like an ma collaboration project it was the first year that they were doing it and since i was there i was like i'm gonna work with the a team uh or like i'm gonna work with a team that i really want to work with so i kind of took over that initial bit Cherry picked the best people from each course or the people who liked me. And then um, we made the project and we stuck all the way to the end of the year. We went to like Spain together for competitions. We went to Dundee for Dare to be Digital, the last Dare to be Digital. Um, really cool experience bringing non-game developers as well into this indie games developers journey or space in education. It was my first time. It was their first time. But there's just so much room for young people there. And I think it was so cool that we got to ride to Senda through that until like until the end of the until I started making games more professionally, really. Yeah. And um I think that Tasenda won also a few awards, right? He had a few official yeah. selections and awards, right? Yeah, I don't <laughs> I don't have my list here. <laughs> but um, you know, that's good. It, when you when you forget, it means that it means that you have so many that, that it's good. <laughs> I think it's I think it's more like I've moved on from uh, that project. I mean, to send a won us like AZ Play in um, I forget which year as play um, for sound uh, for sound and audio, and that was like our first. It got a couple of other recognitions and awards, but they were primarily student, right? And I think for AZ Play, which we went to Spain for uh, Bilbao for, it was like our first time competing with people who were considered themselves like professional games developers, and at that point. I was like, oh, um, maybe I can, you know, now that I've been given the platform, I, I can kind of see myself next to these people who practice professionally. And then I was like, okay, it's time to take, this is our first official award. It's, t it's time to take games development like super seriously now um, <laughs> as a professional and not just as a student who has, uh, who's just doing things for fun. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a good approach, you know, but it, it, it's a bit tricky when you, when you teach game development because... A lot of the students like game, like making games, but they don't necessarily understand the burden mm. that is making and releasing a game. And I think, oh, finishing a game, it's done. It's, it's over. I, I finished the game. I've compiled it. I have the file. 
it's done. No, 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 no. <laughs> that that's only the beginning. <laughs> That's a huge, such a huge journey between those two points. And I don't think I even learned that until today. And it's been like a couple of years since then and a, a couple of games and a couple of years since then. And I still don't fully grasp the, the whole delivery of a game thing. It's like such a big difference between the two things. Mm. Yeah. And I think it's the, the thing that sort of shocked me the most when I started making games, I started, uh, you know, 2011 maybe 2010 i don't know when um it wasn't it was just start the indie wave you know the, the indie golden age had just started basically uh and there were so many opportunities so many possibilities it was super e easy not super easy but it was easy to enter into competitions and stuff and to in entering into events and, and and stuff um i think the reality of what it what it actually means to release a game now, it's something that didn't make me want to keep working on that side of the industry in a way. And you know, as I always say, I love making games. I hate selling them. I hate mm. doing all the things that makes game successful. <laughs> like you know, I, I, some people love the marketing and they, they will be happily doing just that. And I'm the opposite. I just want to code, and that is for me <laughs> what makes it what makes the experience fun, you know, playing with mechanics, playing with games, experiment stuff, everything else. I'm like, no, I don't care how many people buy my stuff. Please don't buy it. <laughs> Just... So I have a very different approach to this because like when I was doing architecture and when I was doing Tascenda and Color City, the project that came after, or I guess Color City was doing a transitional phase, but Tascenda was very much part of my architectural work. And during that time, I think that my approach to games was very much like yours. Like I really liked the whole art side of it. Like it, so selling it didn't really matter. In fact, not having the boundary was a huge part of the work that I made. Um, but when I started working with Chris, who's a very, very commercially minded person, I, I told myself that the projects that we produce from this point will not be... Um, the same as the projects previously. They're not going to be pure art projects. They're going to be like partially commercial projects as well. And once I start, once I let go, actually like it's weird because like once I let go of the part of myself that was kind of saying that like it, everything has to be an art, practice has to be art and practice has to be like um, sacred, very, very sacred. Um, once I let go of that and I started embracing more commercial elements, I found like that I was being much more challenged as a designer to do interesting things like, you know, there, there's more restrictions now and restrictions, I think, make me a better, like being able to work with these restrictions make me a better designer. And suddenly, you know, the whole thing got a lot more interesting, a lot faster. Um, and I found that I didn't, I, I found that like, I still love my projects, even though as they get more commercial, I think that it's like, I thought that I wouldn't when I was like, uh, when I was younger, but then like, as I've gone more into the commercial sector, um, I find that it doesn't really matter what the project is. I think when you spend a long time with your projects, you find something to love about them. Anyway. It's your baby. So now I'm very comfortable with it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, speaking of that, um, I think it's a very interesting take. And probably it's a mentality you sort of need to have if you want this to be a job. Because, you know, you can be lucky mm -hmm. and maybe the game you love and worked on will get on immediately and you will become a millionaire. And then, you know, done, yeah. done for the industry. And it has happened to some people, but it's very unlikely. Nowadays, it's easier to make a sustainable career if you keep making stuff, if you keep creating content, iterating on, you know, on the previous versions. Now, um, on that line, one of the first, well, probably the first sort of commercial uh, games that you made is Too Many Cooks. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, so um, Too Many Cooks, I'll talk a bit about the process that happened, basically. So I explained before that, like, prior to that point, I was making very artsy games. Um, and when I got together with Chris, we decided that we would blend together the weird uh, with something a little bit more commercial. We would try and repackage something uh, for, so that it could be something that it could exist in market and satisfy my need to have something that was really unique and had something that was worth talking about. Um, so we had worked with everyone else in the course. At that time, the course was like four people. <laughs> so it's four to six people. So he has grown a lot like since, since then. <laughs> <laughs> it's grown a lot um, since, um, since I've been there. Um, but, you know, we decided, like, let's work with each other. And then he came over to my house one night. We had a big pitching session. I told him about a couple of games I had in mind. Um, and he said no to all of them. It was like three hours. 
And then I told him, well, I have this other game. Uh, it's a cooking game. So I kind of just drew on my whiteboard. It was just a cross and then a piece of salmon, rice, and like a chopping board. And I explained that you could just drag things over and tap them. And he was like, this is it. And he was like, let's just make it. So that day, we made a paper prototype using like sticky notes and stuff like that. We brought it to class the next day. Um, and then we played the game manually with three people where me and Chris were computers handing out, doing the doing the bit that what the computer would do. So someone's like, oh, I want to transform this uncooked rice into cooked rice. So they'd be like, transform it. And we'd like change the card manually. Um, but we did that. And then we were like, holy shit, it works. It works. Um, and I felt a huge sense of relief because um, with a lot of my other games, to get it to the point where you th like none of my previous games worked like instantaneously. They are like things that you really have to polish and you really have to like work with them to get them to the point where it feels like the concept works. But for some reason, this one with like just paper, it just worked. The timing worked. The pacing worked. People are having a good time. And it was like, whoa, it's like so instantaneous. Um, and then from there, we developed Too Many Cooks as part of Chris's final major project. Um, so it was like a two week prototype. And immediately upon um, doing like two weeks, we submitted it to a bunch of competitions and publishers. Because at, at that point, I had already, you know, been pitching Color City and Tacenda around the block at the games finance market and other places and failing to get any kind of funding. So I already had like some people that I knew to send it to. So I was like, okay, well, we've made something a lot more commercial now. Um, let's send out those emails to people who are like, mm, it's a little bit too artsy for us. And then we sent it to Pocket Gamers Connect as well in London for the big, for the big indie pitch. Um, and it was crazy because we started getting, we start, I started getting emails back immediately. I mean, people were like, oh, we want the demo. This looks interesting. What big improvement compared to last time. And then we also won the big indie pitch. Um, I think that was in the February or one month after Chris's graduation. So we, and then at that point we were like, okay, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's, let's work. Let's stick together. Um, this, this feels like it works. It was, so it's a very fast development cycle. Um, should I keep going? Because the story oh, is pretty Oh, please, long. please go on, go on. I'm quite interested. <laughs> yeah, so one Pocket Gamers Connect first. So like that was Chris's first award and the first one for Too Many Cooks. And then because that one is a pitch where you talk to a lot of different publishers and then they come to you and so they've all seen the game. So they told other people that who were other publishers, if it didn't fit with them, who might have been interested and um, we got a lot of emails from people after that point uh, who had seen Pocket Gamers coverage on us or who I, we had met at the event. Um, but me and Chris kind of swore not to work on too many cooks anymore until we had funding, which is, I think it's a very ballsy move to make. Um, but Chris is very business minded. So he was like, instead of continuously working on this game, we know that it's good enough that it can win a short, a small competition. So that means the quality is decent enough to show the concept. Instead of continuing working on this game, we should make more. We should, you know, in case this doesn't work out, like we should make something else. Um, and then we made Nude Climbers. So the way that one worked was after Pocket Gamers Connect, Chris was heading home to Hong Kong and I was in London. And on the plane ride, he made a prototype and he was like, here's the prototype. What do you want to do with it? And then I kind of just put naked people over it. And we were like, this is it. And then again, both of us were like, this is it, this is it. We think we got it. <clears throat> um, so what happened was that we let Cooks kind of simmer with um, different investors and publishers or like people that we were interested in working with. Because it usually takes a long time to, for people to get back to you. Uh, at that point, I knew that it would be a long time until someone got back to us. So instead of putting more time into it, we kind of just let people think about it while we worked on nude climbers. Um, and then uh, oft actually after... <clears throat> We, we went far enough on Nude Climbers that we went back to Pocket Gamers Connect uh, in a different location, got won another pitch, and then got more publishers talking to us about that. Um, and then what? And then what happened? And then and then it was a long time. It was like it wasn't until like GDC next year where we actually got someone to say, "Okay, yeah, we want this game." And then Too Many Cooks also had the okay from. Actually, the first publisher that I sent it to after after graduation, he would they were they were the ones who were like, okay, let's do this. Um, and so we were working on two of our first games at the same time, right off the bat. 
we knew we were incredibly lucky, but at the same time, we were we were barely holding it together. Well, like, I mean, it was you, like a, you mentioned in that you were incredibly lucky, but I think that beyond that luck, people can probably see that there's a lot of opportunity that you made for yourself and a lot of work without which, you know, the game wouldn't wouldn't have existed even. And um, I remember being uh, being in class and seeing the game changing yeah. so rapidly, so much. And every week, there was a new iteration of the game and a new iteration of the game and another and another one. And it's, it's insane because for me, I would have said, okay, you've done it, you know, second week, it's done, perfect, it's okay. And he said, no, 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 you kept working on it all the time. And I think that this is probably what makes it so good. The fact that you iterated a million times over and over it again. And I think, you know, really, it really made it interesting. I think the rapid development really, like, it was just so, it, we got so hyped, right? There was so much energy there and we felt, that's kind of why we stuck together because we felt like things were just turning. And I think, like, it was definitely partially because I'm more of an artist and game designer and Chris is more of a um, technical guy plus game designer. So this is, like, the first time that we were working with someone who we could, I could completely leave programming up to him and he knew that he could completely leave concept and art up to me and so the rap it was rapid pro prototyping because we would go away and we'd make a lot of leaps and we'd come back together and it would remerge but i do think that the success the the, the, the thing that we did the correctly was actually stop working on it um even though you know it was so rapid i think stopping working on it was the the best move that we could have made mm -hmm. because um if we didn't stop then we wouldn't have had we wouldn't have had time to process what about it worked and what about it people liked. And frankly, any additions that we were making to it wouldn't have affected people's, uh, the, the investors or the publisher's opinion about it. So, um, or the people who we sent the project to. And I think that like, that was such a good move by Chris because um, it means that we can practice more mm. with other games. We can get a bit more warmed up so that when we actually start making it, we're a bit more experienced working together. So, I agree, super rapid prototyping, super fun, but I think calling a stop to something at the right time is also such an important skill because it means you can do other things. Um, I can see in the chat we have half LCC. <laughs> yeah. We have uh, Will. We have Alex, no. we have Will. Uh, uh, I think we have Chris as well. <laughs> we have we have Tesh, so it's it's glad yeah. to see oh, you know oh, so oh. many people so many people joining for these. <laughs> thank you thank I you so even, much. I guys. try not to tell I try not to tell them. <laughs> oh no, tell every tell <laughs> everyone. I need views. <laughs> I need more views, so <laughs> invite more people. Um, so we also have a question from Tim asking, reconnecting to something we were mentioning earlier, asking, what does it mean to be commercial? Is it guided by publishers, audience feedback, common sense? So what, what does it mean, Jai, for you when a project is commercial compared to an arts project? I don't know. I, I think that um, when a project... Well, from a design point of view, I think when it starts becoming commercial, it means that you're juggling more design requirements compared to a completely independent project, right? Um, although I think that a good designer and an experienced designer will kind of create those constraints for themselves, but the a commercial game will juggle constraints that have been decided upon either by industry or by um, meta metadata in the sense where it's like, a lot of people have decided that they like games. For example, let's say a lot of people have decided they like cute games. They don't want any guns in their games. Uh, parents don't want their kids to play games with guns. Like that's not something decided by me. That's decided by the commercial audience as a large. So I can't argue with them that they should. Um, all I can do is accept it. And there's a lot of like, and so when you start designing with those considerations as real considerations and it's not all from you. It's like basically all the restraints are no longer self-generated. Some of the restraints are generated from external factors and they're non-negotiable. Um, I think that's what makes it commercial because you're bending the will of the game to things that you don't control anymore. And I think that that takes a lot of like, you have to be quite humble to do that and you have to your design has to be very flexible. It can't be inflexible because, because if it's not flexible, then it's kind of like, oh, um, I have to design the game for phone. Like, let's say the mobile phones are shaped like this, and my game has to be in something that's shaped like, like that. And if you can't accept that, then you won't survive commercially. So, 
I, for me, it's not really about working with the, for me, it's about those constraints and the publisher and the advertising networks and like the way that things are consumed are all just small constraints. So for example, like I need a game that looks good in a square because most advertising nowadays is done on Instagram and Snapchat and they're very square. So that's a constraint and I need to consider that now. Or a publisher might be like, I want to fund a game that is not too small. It should be a game that is like a medium to large size. So that becomes a consideration that I have to consider that I have to change the design of the game now. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, I, I, I think it does. It's really interesting because um, when you start when you start mentioning what commercial means for you, I thought, mm, I'm not sure I have the same opinion because my, my sort of com- definition of commercial is it's something designed to make money. It's something designed to... to to be a stream of revenue for you that makes it sustainable, while some mm. art projects might not, might just be made because you want to say something. But I think that in a way you mentioned that because you're for you maybe you're looking more at the design aspect, but in that sense the design aspect is designing such a way because it needs to bring money because it, it's it's what people like more in that specific environment. So I think that they sort of. The two aspects sort of converge nicely. <laughs> into... I, I think that they, they have to do with each other. Like you have to obey the commercial to some extent, or you have to consider the, the commercial to some extent to make money. Mm-hmm. But um, it's also, I encourage people to consider it as a really fun design challenge, right? Like I, I certainly see it as a fun design challenge. Um, it's kind of like, I don't know. I think there's some people who say that, you know, if you have a completely blank page, it's interesting. But what's really interesting is like, when you know I, I let's go back to architecture like when you build a piece of architecture in the city you're not building in an empty savanna right like you're not building in the unity setting screen where it's like blank space and there's just like blue everywhere you're building in a city there are people who live there there's a building across from you there are cars that drive by every day and it's in designing the right building to fit perfectly in there considering everything that's around you which is fun like you get to create stuff that is like it doesn't i don't know it 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 has context all of a sudden it has something real tangible about it i think that's it's a lot of fun to play around with that yeah so um one memories i have of too many cooks is that during its development there is something that has not changed and it's as many years have passed still owns me sometimes it's the sound (laughs) So basically, uh, I'm showing yeah. a video of the, of the of the of the game in the background, and basically you have to you have to click super super rapidly onto the you know the salmon, the chopping board, the, the the dishes to clean them, to chop stuff, and there's this like chop 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 sound. Chop, 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 chop. And yeah. I think everyone everyone who has tested this game knows the sound effect. Basically, <laughs> and the music, the music of Too Many Cooks when it starts, I've heard that hundreds of times because it was literally the background of class <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> i think that at one point I, I even started dreaming about it because it was so intense <laughs> and it was I, so I think, <laughs> yeah i think oliver oliver wegmuller who did my sound who's one of my first like collaborators who worked with me on tosenda uh, which we won the sound award for has worked with me on all of my games so far and like i think that initial audio like we're doing a new project right now and I'm, I'm like thinking back now and it really makes me it really makes me like appreciate how strong like audio design is um you know i don't think that it's like i i think that it's uh, it's always better when a game considers audio early on in the game's development because sometimes that missing thing that you're waiting for is audio um it's like it, it has part of the project soul like for Oliver, what's Oliver has been able to do is that for all the projects that he's been on so far, especially too many cooks, the first thing that he has made, which is kind of like an identity sketch of the game has always been something that has like basically given it an identity and added to the design. Nice. Right. Like, because if I think about it in a design way, because the, the sound of chop, 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 chop sounds so good. I knew that I could do rapid tapping mechanics and it would be fine, right? I think that's like a bit of exaggeration maybe, but it allowed me to think about the design in that way because of because we had such a strong audio identity so early in the development. And it's something that I would like to do with my future projects too, because if you have an audio person, I don't think 
if you have an audio person who can do more than just make nice sounding audio, but find the identity of the project audioly, then that con I think that contributes to games develop to the game's design. Uh, and I don't think it's something that can be added at the end. I think that it has immense value. So, I, I, um, I think it's... You're reacting to that. I think you're reacting to that. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the the development of Too Many Cooks was definitely driven a lot by the sound. Not necessarily by the music, you know, because the music is more or less, you know, in the background. But you, you're doing something very tactile. You're doing something very physical on, you know, on a screen. On a screen. Mm. So you needed, you really needed that feedback. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if that was a temp sound that ended up staying, but like, chop, 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 chop. <laughs> I'm obsessed. <laughs> I think the, the chop, chop, chop sound was the same from day one. Like, I think that he nailed it on the first. Mm. Is session. it his voice? He, was it him like, saying chop? I... Or was it you was saying it chop? Who, who, did, who did say chop? <laughs> yeah. I, the, so I, we did, when we talked about it, I did say that like, Everything comes from the kitchen, so I feel like it's a very mouth thing. So I said that for all the sound effects, I think the concept should be that you say the words, right? So like boil, chop, pop, pop. Like, and like, I think all the sound effects needed to be made with your mouth uh, to have that very food feel or mouth feel to it. <laughs> nice, and, nice um, way of putting that. Yeah, so I, I think it kind of worked out. I think it was a good call. Um, we, st we still didn't really get the... It didn't turn out the way I thought it would. I thought it would be a lot more like, I thought it'd be a lot more sensually mouthy, but um, it came <laughs> well, out really cute and I really like it. So. <laughs> well, no, no, I think it, I think it, it really worked, you know? So in, in that kind of sense, it was definitely, definitely a success. So, oh, we, we did have the leftover where when you finish a recipe, it goes, ah, like, ah, <laughs> like I've just released pressure from my body. Um, that bit stayed, so that 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 definitely that, stayed. That that that's <laughs> that. So, um, something you've been mentioning throughout, you know, this this entire conversation is basically the fact that, um, what you think was for you the impact of being able to study game design? Uh, what do you think really? Do you think it really helped you? What aspects of studying game design really worked for you and for for your game? You mentioned, of course, that collaborative elements w what else what else do you think work for you because i was moving over from architecture right and um i think architecture as a profession and as a field of study is not nearly as open as games design is i think that games design you know you've got all these like academic level competitions it is something that everyone can really contribute to it's something that's been part of people's lives from childhood it's not so um if i if like if i think about architecture like um you some people you can draw a line on a sheet of paper right but then building that line in reality has to go through like a billion people and a billion things it has to go through the government restriction <laughs> building code it has to go through a big brick layer who has to mix the cement and like put the two things together and has to stack a hell of a lot of them and there's a lot of money involved in order to just make that one line so in that sense i think games design as a academic as a as a kind of practice is just super super approachable so i think that the the games the the study of it benefits from this it is there's a lot of like junior or novice level uh, places to show and get appreciation for your work, which is not in a professional setting, um, which architecture didn't have. And there's a really strong sense of community where there are separate roles that we can occupy, which are not just the designer role. I think that you'll find in like other uh, practices or other academia, like for example, let's go back to architecture or illustration, everyone wants to be the director because the the bricklayer doesn't go to school here. And the guy who argues with the government to get your building made, he doesn't go to school here either. Um, but in games development, you know, the artist and the animator and the narrative person and the programmer and the director can all be in the same room at the same time and we can be relatively inexperienced and we can make something cool. So, yeah, so... <laughs> Wait, no, that doesn't answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think it gives an interesting perspective, you know, so in a way. I, I remember that there was something that I wanted to say about uh, how I felt about the academia. But oh, God. I don't... <laughs> that... I don't... 
I don't remember. No, don't worry. Remember. You 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 can say you can say whatever. Really, it's not a problem. No, no, I don't. No, I don't remember. Like I remember there was. I I think the collaborative part is like probably the strongest bit. But I think that for me, I also benefited from being in London as well because you know London has so many great venues that I can bring the game to and get support for, um, and feel that I. And it's very inviting. It brings you into the community really quickly. Um, and because of that, I think that I transition. I could transition from an amateur to a professional much more easily compared to another profession. Um, you mentioned something yeah. really interesting What's because um, when I started making games, I know that there were a lot of like, not a lot, but there were quite a few events around. And mm. the way I just got into them was just asking. I just sent, you know, just sent emails to people and I was like, hi, I've noticed that you had this event. Can I join? <laughs> and, and that sort of works. And the fact that in London there are so many events means that, you know, there mm. are more chances for you to show your stuff and, you know, for your stuff to be on the showcase. But I think you also need that, that extra step of being proactive because, you know, if you're not, if you're not, if you're not acting, people are unlikely to ask you, you know, it's just not going to happen. It's, it will be very, very unlikely unless your stuff is exceptionally good and that the exception is not, is not really, really the rule. And I think that people, for example, like um, Rami Ismail, they, you know, he's often talking about how he started before he had a chance to have, uh, you know, his own booth, uh, GX, I don't know, a GDC. He just got there with his laptop asking people to play games. Or oh, with the iPad or whatever, you know. I'm not that brave. <laughs> well, oh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if you remember or if that phase was already over. But when I started, I was the guy giving out biscuits because yeah. uh, that's how I approach people. <laughs> I sort of lured them into, oh, "Hi, do you want a biscuit? Do you want a cookie?" Um, I was just luring them to play the game with that. So it's 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 a little perks that nobody nobody else was doing, and he allowed me to gain traction you know to get to get people interested in the stuff i was doing just because i think that's, I think that's a really cool idea especially if you feel like you're fish out of water in that area i think something like food or something small and cute really like helps you stay at a small scale but bring lets you interact with someone in a not creepy way very easily <laughs> yeah no it's it, I, i think it's especially important because when i arrived here i was super huggy super hug person And I know that a lot of people did not appreciate that. Maybe here it was seen slightly different from, you know, the, the, the intention I wanted to be seen. So I was like, okay, I need to find something else that is not necessarily physically based, but I can still help people. I mean, it creates all sort of other issues because then you get... I often had people like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Food, food issues and like food safety. Yeah, and <laughs> some people are like, they terrified of germs. There are a few game devs they say, no, 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 I'm terrified of germs. I can't get, if it's an open package, I can't get it. Or some people were just yeah. like, oh, sorry, like I'm vegan or, or like I'm diabetic. And I was like, okay, I can't. <laughs> I had a food selection it, at some it, point. It, it, works for, it works for most people. It works for most people. <laughs> you, you go to, you go to uh, EGX, it works. <laughs> it works for the majority of well, players. I just realized um, that one of, that was uh, back to the previous question. I'm like, what else happened? in the education process that really helped. So I was moving over from a design medium where I've never touched code in my life, right? So I think it was, I think the speed at which I picked it up was quite fast. And I think the reason for this was that I joined a course which was like four people. And because of that, I could completely monopolize the time of the people who were teaching, like, um, like David, who had to kind of like sit with me every day because there's only four people i'm 25 of the course if i need help then like i'm getting help um and so i was able to really have such a such a intense hands-on teaching experience which i don't think that you could get with an online course or something like that uh, for um, me that that is the actual thing that for me makes the difference between online education and in-person academic traditional education is not necessarily the material, because for example, I keep saying to my students, oh, search these things online, <laughs> you know? So yeah, the content yeah. is, not, is not what makes the difference, is the interaction. You mentioned the interaction with your colleagues and the interaction with, you know, the tutors, the lecturers. For me, that is what makes the difference. The fact that I'm giving you a safe space where you can fail, safely. 
you know, without consequences. Yeah. I'm telling you what's wrong and I'm telling you how to fix it. Try to try to do that on Facebook. Uh, I have I have so many Facebook groups where you know mm. people talk about game design, game development, Unity, programming, C sharp. I hate most of them. <laughs> I hate Facebook in general and I hate groups in general, but that's me. But it's it's you know because I can post my stuff there, I can get updated from other devs. It's 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 pretty helpful. But mm. try to ask a question there. People will will make you feel terrible because it's like they will make jokes, they will say your stuff is rubbish, or, or you know they they will not they will not give you an uh, a nice feedback. And I think that mm. learning how to give proper constructive feedback it's a skill. The Facebook doesn't teach. <laughs> Quite the opposite. <laughs> I don't think you should be look, expecting Facebook to teach it. No, you um, know, you know, but I think that it, it, it's pretty traumatic for some people, and it can discourage them. And I know that a lot of a lot of the people that came to me with games, and they yeah. show me their prototypes, they're rubbish. They're absolutely rubbish. But it's okay because they're learning. So of course they're yeah. crap, of course they're bad, of course nobody will ever pay f to play something like that. But that's not the yeah. point, the point that you're learning. So from that mess, what can I help you? How can, wh what is the smallest step I can help you with to make it less crap? And this is how I'm yeah. seeing it. How, what is the potential I can focus on rather than saying, oh, it's crap. So it's that kind of experience and interaction that you won't get from an online course. Yeah, definitely. But also, and, yeah, yeah, go on. No, and even more so as courses get, uh, I think like, it's also, con I'd also like to bring up the importance of like contact time, right? Because like the more people who are vying for one person's attention, the less, the less time, the less interaction each of those people are going to get, right? And so I think that like, I'm tempted to say like, you don't even need to go to the, best school sometimes you need to get, go to the school where the person who you're working with is going to give you the most of themselves mm -hmm. i think that's more valuable than just having someone who's really really experienced but you're in a hall with like 300 people right there um it's like a not very personal relationship and also I think if you're a student do not be scared to ask for help because you're literally paying to get out and yeah. And this is really what upset me. That a lot of students sometimes don't ask for help. They do not interact. And, you know, sometimes it's cultural. Sometimes they just don't care. <laughs> sometimes they're just there for a visa. Sometimes do you think they're it's scared. An age thing? I, it's an age thing or do you think it's like a cultural thing? Because, like, obviously I came in at a master's degree level for games. Mm -hmm. And so people are quite, I think people are a lot more involved. Um but I don't know. Is it something that people are just learning when they get older, or is it because people? I I, I think there's definitely a component related to the culture you come from. At least you know mm. it's it's what I've seen. Uh, you know I'm pretty I'm very loud. <laughs> I I'm forcing myself not to interrupt people on the show, but you know it's I'm Italian. It's what I do best: interrupting people, right? <laughs> Uh, so I have no problem in doing that, but I know that some people maybe might see that as very disrespectful and, mm. you know, maybe different cultures, maybe different colleges, maybe different institutions. They, they don't really like people interrupting or people asking, or maybe some students might feel that they're a burden or that they might feel that they're stupid if they ask questions because, oh, I can't do this. If I tell them that I can't, if I ask how to do it, they know I can't do that, which is something I have a bit nowadays when I want to make a tutorial. I'm really afraid of asking on forums because then people will find out I didn't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, in a way, I'm learning as well. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't born with the knowledge in, inside. So in a way, if you look for a lot of stuff I've done, you can probably find out how I've learned and people who, who helped me. So, um, oh, we actually have um, a message from um, from Alex saying, yep. that's what I regret when I was um, at LCC the most. Uh, part because mm -hmm. of the culture, part because of my broken English. But, you know, I, I can see the problem. I can see a lot of people being very afraid, um, especially if you talk about code. It's something so specific that you need the right language. And not many people have yeah. it. So on top of the cultural, the language, the, the coding barrier, you have all those things that make it much, much harder for you 
to ask for help. But if you don't ask, nobody's giving you anything. Uh, or it's, yeah. very, it's very unlikely. I think like, um, especially with a short course, like LCC's course, um, I think that when you come into education and you realize you only have a very small period of time to make the most of what you have to do, I think that it's weird because like the cultural and language barrier is like one thing, but at the same time, you've got such a short period of time that you like, if, if I was talking to someone who was coming in, the things that I've said has, have been like, you really don't have time to think about what other people think of you. You really have to aggressively pursue it because it's only like a year. The course is only a year. How are you going to transition your profession basically in one year? It's not possible unless you're super aggressive and you're ready to burn bridges and burn like, and just like charge through, even if no one has any idea of what you're talking about. Um, you, I think you do kind of need to throw away the, you kind of need to throw away the restraint in you and like go for it. Um, and I think that that's like kind of fun. I think you'll find other people. Usually it's the same. I think people say the same with dating, right? They're like, oh, you just have to like throw yourself in there. Like literally, um, otherwise no one's going to take notice of you, even if you don't know what you're talking about. And so I think that, um, that people need to have, I understand what you're talking about, Alan, where, um, academia is like a safe space where people can practice freely. But at the same time, I think it's important to light a fire under people's asses and be like, you only have like a year or X amount of time of this. You really have to go for it. Otherwise, you might not ever find yourself. Um, you never might not find the thing that you're looking for and you might run out of time. Um, yeah. Something something we have um, at Goldsmith. I don't know how it works at LCC because we never really had that. Uh, I never really explored that. Um, is that students can get extensions, you know, if they have issues specific something something happened to them they can get an extension and sometimes students don't ask for extensions and they don't get and mm -hmm. they don't they will not get one you know we're not going to give to them uh, unless unless they ask for it and this is often one reasons why why they fail but it's also i think the opposite problem students that they ask too many extensions because they feel they can't do it and often I've seen this happening with people, for example, that have learning disabilities, that they've been taught that they can't do it in the same way everybody else can. And sometimes you can see that some people have been, I don't want to say damaged, but I would say they've been terrified, probably, of not being good enough because they've been reinforced that. So what I'm often trying to do is, okay, you think you will need this extension? You have it if you need it. And maybe we give it already, but can you still try to submit before the deadline? If you don't, if you can't, it's fine. You still have an extra week, an extra two weeks, how long it is. But try to do it beforehand. Also because I think that we need to give students the best chances, the best environments for them to succeed. And sometimes this means giving them an extension, but sometimes it means not giving them an extension. Because if yeah. you have an exhibition, you're not going to have an extension for your deadline. There's is, there is sometimes in life where there is no additional yeah. extension. Or when you get one, it's very pain. You have to really beg for it. Like, it's really painful, yeah. the extension. Or it's going to cost you. You're going to lose opportunities. Yeah. So sometimes, like if, you know, if it, I feel you need to have a certain, as you said, a certain level of pressure because you need to get stuff done sometimes. And, you know, we don't want the pressure to crush people and to, and to destroy them, of course. But if, if, if you're really stressed and you're borderline panicking before an exam, well, sometimes it's okay because it's a pretty big day. It's a pretty big deadline. So that is not necessarily bad. If it affects you personally beyond that exam, maybe that's a problem. But if it doesn't, especially if you, if you want this to be your job, you will need to deliver on time and you will need to ask for help and you need to get to get proactive. So those to me are the skills that distinguish students. And I can you can often often working in the industry for so many years, you can often see these as a sort of the, the best proxy for success, I think, in most industries. And it's the fact that if you don't if you're not proactive, if you don't do things yourself, they're not going to get done. 
And uh, there's, a, there's a really funny message from Chris saying, I only go to school when I need help. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. Chris always says this. I know you were teaching Chris, so I don't know how you feel about it. But Chris really did only come in when he wanted to ask you a specific question. And well, Chris is like, to okay, be fair, I'm, <laughs> I'm really happy with that. Because if that means that the rest of the time you're spending working on stuff that is relevant to you, then fuck the, fuck the yeah. journey. Just work more, you know. I think the problem might be when students don't know that they... Yeah, they don't know what they exactly. want. They, they, there's no reason that they didn't Oh, they in, think... Rather than there being like a very specific reason why they're like, I don't think I need to. Or, I'm going to make better. Yeah, or maybe they think the like, um, oh, I, I really know this topic, so I don't need to, to come today. And then I'm like, no, you really don't know anything about this topic, do you? So I think that, you know, in terms of Chris, you work really well because it's, it's really skilled. And he's very proactive yeah. at doing things. I think, you know, it was one of the best programmers we had at LCC when I when I worked there. So I, I had and no Chris problem. Chris doesn't even program anymore. What's again? <laughs> he refuses to program now, kind of. <laughs> But um, um, we also have a message from Alex saying, um, so true, talking about the not asking question. I wish I had a second chance. Well, that's a good thing. You do not have a second chance with LCC, but you also you have another chance now. Whatever you do, be proactive. You know, talk as much as you can with people, ask for help, get their feedback. And this is something that is really, really important, especially if you're making video games that need to be played by other people. So by definition, yeah. those games need to appeal to other people. You need to do playtesting. You need to ask feedback. And you need to learn how to get really harsh feedback from people. Because when you put your stuff online, people are not going to say, mm, I think that this could be improved. They will say it's shit. <laughs> That's what they will say. Yeah, and it's a very it's a very like communal, especially when you start at the indie scale and you kind of like go up that ladder. The indie scale, the the smaller scale operations of like game design is like it's really homey and it's very small scale. And because of that, like interactions or connections that you make with people, they can kind of carry you through um quite quickly it's not like some industries where it's like oh in school you don't really need to know anyone and then when you get out you really have to know a ton of people there's like a very there's like a curve to it right and so i think that it is i think having being well connected and like seeing getting lots of comments for your games and having people be like hey you know talk to this person talk to that person um it's super super important i think that they it's it's a it's a huge blessing that the games industry is so much at the smaller scale is so much more human and communal. And I think that people should take advantage of it because it's not the same for everyone. It's not the same for all the other industries. And it's something that people should know that is one of our strong points. Right. Yeah. And so if you're not taking advantage of it, it's a real shame. Especially if you're paying for it. <laughs> so please students. I mean, uh, yeah. I, my education wasn't as expensive as it is now. So I was really lucky, but oh, things have got a much more expensive so it's quickly. much more it gets so much more expensive so make every penny count ask questions like there's no tomorrow because you know you're paying the same whether you ask no questions or you ask one every day but in one case you can get more help so you know that's my advice to to, to newcomers and yes you know sometimes some students might get annoying if they ask too many questions but i think that um because we don't at the same time we don't get paid <laughs> we get paid the same yeah. even if we answer emails all day but that's if true. if we see that there's a genuine interest, I'm more than happy to to help. Of course, you know my time is limited, so I can't always do that. Of course, and I, there need to be a certain proportion. I cannot spend 15 hours with one student and one hour with one. But as long as I can, as I can get people interested, I think you know that works. Now, um, with that being said, there's another game that is on the commercial line. I guess talking with what yeah. we said before that um, I would like you maybe to talk a bit about it's nude climbers can you can you say something about it yeah so nude climbers was based off a prototype that chris made when he was on the flight back to hong kong um we skinned it we found an art style that really worked for it um it's based off one of my favorite dessert places in uh london uh the art style and it was us trying to get into more one finger type hyper casual games something with a control scheme that you could understand immediately when looking at it right or something that looks 
funny within a phone screen. Like too many cooks works because it has a lot of different systems working together, like passing, chopping, tapping, chop, and stuff chop, like chop, that. Chop. But this time we wanted a primarily visual experience uh, that you could understand uh, just going up linearly. Um, and I don't know, like, yeah, a game that you could understand simply by looking at it. That was the prompt. And in that sense, it was more commercial. Like it, the scope was a lot smaller, right? Like it, does, it doesn't really require complex economy or something like that. Uh, and so it was our attempt at seeing if we could make something which was more in line with what hyper casual or just casual games were doing at the time. However, I will say that in hindsight, um, there were key factors about the game that made it very difficult. It made it not really work with the constraints of the commercial industry. For, for example, like the game is quite slow to play. And I think that um, each cycle of the gameplay before you die is quite long, which means that it doesn't really open itself up for ads, for earning money through ads. And so um, it was at that point, I think the lesson I really learned from Nude Climbers were like, uh, we, 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 you know, we redesigned a lot of climbers to try and fit those constraints. But that was when I really learned the lesson the hard way that some mechanics are not as well suited for certain types of making money. Like games where you die faster or have faster cycles sometimes do better, right? Um, simply because like if they die more, they're probably going to watch more ads. Um, and slower experiences might have to do something more to, to, to like fill up your or offer more some kind of experience that makes up for that fastness. Also, Climbers has these, I, I think it looks, I love the look of the game. Um, still, you know, the naked butt that shows up when you like move the certain body parts. But because there are four limbs and you kind of need to move them piece by piece, it's not really a one finger game experience. It's a game experience where you need both hands and you, you know, you're moving these limbs. And so that kind of goes against the whole like play on the go experience, right? Uh, a really good example that someone I met in uh, Casual Connect Asia gave to me is that their games are designed that way because like when you're stuck in a very densely packed uh, commute or train, you have to hold the rail with one hand. So you can't expect people to play with two hands. Um, and that's just like a design consideration that you have to go under. If it's really busy, then people might not be able to play your game if it requires two hands. So that's one fault with climbers as well. It it needs the finger, multiple fingers, to travel from the bottom of the screen to the top of the screen. Um, and I don't think I felt thought about game design so f in such tactile in such a tactile way before we did climbers. But so for I think for the future attempts for like more commercial games, we will take that into greater consideration, making it easier and considering our users who might not have that spare hand to play the game. <laughs> it's really interesting because you probably know this, but there's always a big uh, discussion, a big conversation between me and David King, uh, which was the course leader of the course where Jai, uh, the game design course where Jai was, was enrolled in. And it's the fact that he's making a million games, but none of which I've had. So they're all free to play, free, not even free to play, free. And there's no chances of making money from those games because they have no ads. They're not designed with that intention. And every time I'm like, David, make ads, make million. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I can see that he doesn't want to do that because it's not the reason why he's making the game. Talking yeah. back to commercial, he doesn't want the game to be commercial. He wants to have fun. He wants to explore game design. So they don't have to make games. Otherwise, as you said, if... He had to make money from those games. He had to compromise, or at least compromise is a strong word. He had to um, find a balance between the design and the ads and how they've been delivered and how they've been played. And it's not what it's, what it's interested in doing. And I think it takes... I don't know. I, mean, I think that it's... I think that calling it compromise kind of like poses it in the wrong light, right? Like, for example, in the example that I gave you, um, thinking about how money is earned from the game directly makes you think about both how much money or how much time users have to spare for your game. And also I brought in like the physicality of the device as phones get taller. And if I have to move my leg from one, from the bottom to the top, like I physically don't have enough space on my phone. It's true, to right? It. I can't, I can't oh. hold my phone. It's too big. <laughs> Yeah. So, but it's not until 
because it seems like a great game at a small scale, but it's not until you really start considering it for all users in a commercial way that you learn these really hard lessons. So um, I don't I don't consider that compromise. For that example, I consider that like a new design dimension that you wouldn't really know until you really wanted to push this game seriously, right? Um, and I think that every designer, I think it's fun to design without restriction, but it's with restriction that the thing becomes more rich. The design becomes more rich because you're considering more things. Yeah, It's really interesting because I think it's the design aspects, for example, of game jams. The fact that yeah. you not only have like a short amount of time, but you also have usually a theme. I'm thinking the global game jam, Ludum there. They often have a strong theme. And you're free to interpret that as loose as you want. So a lot of people cheat, basically. They have games already made, almost already made, and they just do a tiny, tiny change to adjust the topic of the game. And I think that that is really not the spirit of, of the jam. It's not making the best game possible. It's a challenge for yourself and your team more than make something amazing. I think that people are not always approaching the Ludum there with the with the most sensible mind, in, if that's what they do. But the fact that you have a limitation forces you to come up with ideas. And the fact that you do not have much time to do that means that, well, we need to iterate fast. We do not have time to find the perfect idea. We need to find one that works in a couple of days. And I made some pretty good stuff, I think, while I was under that kind of pressure, including a commercial game. So it sort of worked, worked well for me, I guess. Mm. But it's something that people should appreciate appreciate much more. That sometimes... It's a, it's a bit paradoxical, but you can be more creative when you're working under constraints. Because it forces yeah. you to find more interesting solutions. It's a bit like when in school they ask you to, to make an essay on everything and it's like, what do, I, what do I talk about? I, I have no idea. But I say, talk about these, these and these. Now it's your focus. You're not necessarily constrained. You're focused onto a specific sub subject, theme, technology, and that is the difference. It's not just a constraint, it's a focus on, 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 on that. And it, it tests the it tests your design capability, right? Like it's a great test to show how versatile of a designer you are. Um, because you know, a good you know, there are I, I think I like to talk about this sometimes. I, I think I mentioned it to some like uh, designers when they're in school, where there's like there's ideas which are like five minute ideas and there's like ten minute I and then there's like half like a day ideas and then there's like ideas that are good for like a month and then there's like ideas that are good for like a year right and if you're looking for a project to commit to yourself for to commit yourself to for like a really long period of time it needs to be a really well tested and versatile idea and this means that the idea itself is such a good one that you could cut its limbs off or like make it contort in a weird way and it would still be a good idea and I think that if you get designers who are too used to having no constraints, the danger is that oftentimes that their designs will be designs that don't have the ability of adaptation, right? Um, they, they only work under a very specific set of conditions. They like, you don't end up with something where it's like, oh, I could put it in this setting. I could put it in this setting. I could put it in, I could have on mobile. I could put it on like the Apple TV. I could put it, as a tiny, I, as I, could, I could put it as an art project in a horizontal browser. I could make it an art installation. Um, the idea, a good idea, which is well tested, will be so rich that you can put it wherever you want and you could sell it to, ideally you'd sell it in any way you want as well. So um, for me, that commercial part is about making a more versatile and rich design and a richer designer. I, I think this is such an interesting take and it's something that not a lot of students and even not a lot of young game developers actually understand. And I see so many times people that they have this gigantic idea that they've always been having for their entire lives and they want to make it. And it's like, you know, an MMO with 50 different characters and an, an immense story and stuff like that. And it's like, 
how many millions do you have <laughs> to make this game yeah. into a reality? And the things you said about... But I think that that's, that's kind of like a symptom of like not being able to boil down the idea, right? Like, it's not... It shouldn't be... A good idea is not the MMO part or like the... Or it might be. But um, I think that the more experienced and more versatile designer will be able to realize that actually what makes this game cool and doable is this really small seed that can grow in a bunch of different ways. And that seems to like a puzzle platformer or it can grow into something I can spend five minutes making or it might grow into something that I need to spend two years making. Um, and I think like, uh, wait, I forgot, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I, real, I kind of understand where you were going with it, but I kind of derailed it. Um, uh, don't worry. I think that um, this reminds me of uh, the time I was at GDC in San Francisco. They yeah. had this thing that they sort of call the um, escalator pitch. So in the Moscone Center, where GDC usually yeah. takes place, they have this incredibly long escalator. And it lasts, I don't know, 30 seconds maybe. And some people <laughs> were like, okay, pitch me your idea in 30 seconds. Because if to get interested into your idea, I need to, to hear the story of this space, colony, empire. Oh, I don't care. What is this game about, really? If you can't say yeah. in three minutes, probably you're confused. Probably, you, or at least you do not have a very good overview about what your game really is about. And I think that this can be done on so many different games, especially now that people do not have much time. You need to capture attention with just a few keywords. You need to be able to yeah. find a way to sell your game really, really well. Otherwise, you know, you're wasting people's time. You need to be able to distill what your game really is about in one sentence, one tweet. You know, maybe your game is an exception, but more likely you will need to do that at some level if you want to capture people's attention, especially if you need money. A lot of publishers hear ideas yeah. all day, all day, literally their job. You need to find a way to get their attention in less than 30 seconds. Even in an email, you know, you need to get their attention now. Otherwise, you're losing them and you're losing the money and the opportunity, professional and personal, that they can offer you, I think. Hopefully, hopefully it makes sense. In the meantime, yeah, yeah, no, no, it, it makes complete sense. I'm just kind of trying to think about like how that, how my opinion of that has like changed over the years. Like, I, I think that like definitely distillation. Um, if it's not able to be distilled, you're very unlikely to work well in a pitch. But I think that it's also just another test that people do because like if an idea doesn't have the ability to be distilled into a short period of time. How exactly am I going to make a five-second ad for this that's going to work for a person? Nice. <laughs> you know, I, Very nice. Like, um, like, because there, I have to pay for the ads for this, and like, they're only going to look at it for like five to ten seconds. So if you can't tell me about it in words in like five to ten seconds, then what makes you think that they're going to get it visually in five to ten? Oh, seconds? you can do. You Which can do like all those ads I, I, that some ideas are more visual. Some ideas are more visual than they are like wordy, right? Mm -hmm. But some ideas are more wordy than they are visual. So I don't know. I'm thinking about all those ads that basically they show something completely unrelated to the game <laughs> and then you get to buy them to buy and say, like, this is not, this is not the video I watched. <laughs> That's the <laughs> That's what worst you possible you can, I mean, probably for some reason, maybe they, they do well financially, but it's a terrible thing to do. Please don't do it if you want to be a, a good game developer and, and don't, don't do those kind of tricky things. Yeah. And um, in the meantime, if you have any question for Jai, feel free to leave it. Where is the chat? <laughs> feel free to leave it in uh, in the chat. And hopefully we... We had a question a while ago from Ahmed who asked like general suggestions on how to improve game design skills. Thank you so much. I forgot uh, about that. Sorry, Ahmed. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know if he's still here, but I, will, I think it's a good question to like ask on anyway. But I think that... um. Again, like I'm going to approach this more from an academic level because I think when you're at working at the professional level, everyone kind of has their own strategies for this. Um, but an academic level, um, if you want to practice your game design skills, then my biggest advice is to design games or work on games in school, which actually demonstrate game design. Because what I find is like I've talked to a lot of people or I've mentored a couple of people who they will be working, they, they consider themselves game designers and they would like to be games designers, 
However, the stuff that they're working on are not focused on games design, right? So they might be working on a project which is very, which, you know, each project, kind of like a build in a video game, has its spec. They focus on different things. It might be an art-focused game, or it might be a narrative-focused game, or it might be a level design-focused game. So there's really very little point for someone who wants to be a games designer specifically to be focusing on making games which are intensively, for example, art focused, because they're going to be wasting a lot of their time doing something that doesn't really, that might benefit them in the short term, but doesn't really benefit their long term goals. Right. And so one example is um, James, James Cox, who I met at Dare to be Digital, got quite well known. I think he, which school did he go to? Oh, well, I can't remember. Anyways, he got quite well known in the games industry for doing 100 games in five years, right? And his stuff is like really wacky and janky. But doing 100 games in five years, which is kind of ridiculous, um, is a very good way of demonstrating that you know you have the ability to create an idea and to design a game, right? Um, in the same way, if you really want to be a games designer in terms of like level design or economy design, then you better be working on a project that requires you to do level design or economy design. There's really no point in you doing like a narrative project at this point and saying that you're trying to practice in game design. So what I see in school right now is a kind of inefficiency that people are working on projects that don't pursue the skill set that they think that they want. So, um, so I think that people should be very Time is very limited. I think people should be very selective about what skills they want and what they want to train because you can make any project in the world, but this, considering this will help you decide what kind of project you want. And when you give me your portfolio at the end of the day, it's not just going to be like, oh, I just made this thing because it was like a good idea at the time, but I really want to be a level designer. And then I look at the portfolio and like, which, how, how many levels are there in here? It's like, yeah, well, one per game. I'm like okay, that's that, that's not that's not great. That's not great. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense, but basically, if you want to get better at something, make sure you're doing a lot of that thing and you're not doing other things. I, I think that's a that's a good that's a good advice. Uh, I, I wish more people that start working in the industry or maybe they study could hear some of these <laughs> because it's it's the mis those are the mistakes I see a lot of people doing, and you know it's something that you you eventually you will learn it. But if you learn it the hard way, you're wasting time, you're wasting money, you're wasting projects, you're wasting people's <laughs> experience and collaborations, opportunities, yeah. I think. So um, on, you've been working on a lot of things. So on top of all the projects that we've just discussed, I know you yeah. also just recently dis um, announced a new project, this mini theme park. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, so um, uh, Theme Park Island um, is a mobile game that we've made with another publisher. Um, it's the first game that we've designed, which is much where the prompt was kind of the given to us more. Like they they kind of like knew what type of game or what genre it should fit into. And we we've given the freedom to approach that and approach that genre and hit it with whichever way we, we thought was best, right? Um, so it's not work for hire, but it was, it's definitely not work for hire. But the idea of like being given the game prompt prior to working together is really, really an interesting way to work because the person that you're working with is going to have picked that genre for a reason, but the, the prompt is still open enough that as designers, we can try to address what they're trying to address with their selection um, without really having to juggle with what is it that we're making. Um, so yeah, Theme Park Island is like an idle type game where you build a, a theme park on a series of an archipelag, archipel uh, on a series of islands um, around town. Like there's these little people that run around, everyone runs in a specific order. Um, people work in very like set cycles. So what they do is like every person always turns clockwise. And if there is a, road or something that can be accessed they will always turn right and using this system we kind of build like a super simple ai system for everyone to walk around um and it's something that you can kind of leave there let play um i think i would call it like a casual game 
But it's very different from the other games that we've made because it's much more of a genre piece in that sense because it fits into construction and economy and idol driven games, which is not something that we had done before. But I will say that I think that we learned the most about game design in general from this project, even though it was a very small project, because we were given the prompt and we were creating something for an existing and successful genre. Um, I think we learned a ton from it because up until this point, we were a lot more like free about the game design. It's like we make this decision because we think that it would work rather than it being informed by um, our predecessors in game design or like informed by statistics. So um, I don't think that that's how I was supposed to pitch it, but um, <laughs> but that's what I learned from it anyway. Incredibly tight, incredibly small game design uh, scope, but because it's genre piece, we're learning a ton from it. And because it's more commercial, we're learning a ton from it as well. Um, really, really happy with that project. It came out so fast compared to our other games as well. Um, we really, because we were working with someone, who, with the, the publisher, we really had to have the idea much more, I know we, we, we had to present, uh, how do I say it? The idea had to be a lot more crisper in our mind. The development cycle had to be a lot faster because it was intended to go to live a lot sooner. And I think this goes back to something that a lot of game developers say, like you really should go to an open beta or an open alpha as soon as possible. It's really just so much more beneficial if you build a fan base and let people actually react to your game. Um, and it's not the same. And it was at this point that I realized that letting people react to it at a showcase level, which is like, you know, I'm at EGX, I show maybe the game to like 100 or 200 people a day, to compare to 5,000 people, unique people are playing this game each day and they're giving us our comments through stat statistics. Um, that's a completely lev different level of intimacy with your audience, which I think I definitely needed that wake up call. Um, that's I learned tons from this project. I really like it. Yeah. So I have a question for you. So you've been working on a variety of different projects. Some of them were very commercial, like this one, but you know, like yeah, yeah. Um, too many cooks. Some were more personal or emotional, artistic driven. Let's go with that. So in terms of feedback, they of course not just have different feedbacks, but they they appeal to different audience. So when you ask for mm. feedback. I imagine that the comments you get from a casual player playing a game like this one, like an idle game, it's very different from the type of feedback you would usually get from someone playing Tassenda, which is an emotional journey or something like that. Mm -hmm. How did you, how was that your experience? How did it work for you? I think that um, with these kind of games where there's a higher number, the more like commercial type games where there's a really large volume of people who are playing your game and you don't have enough time to form an individual connection with everybody, um, you're getting a lot of their feedback through their numbers. Like how many people are doing this action? How many people are clicking this? So they're not really talking to you, <laughs> right? But in some ways it's like a lot more truthful as well. When you make like an artistic game or an emotional game, sometimes pe I think people usually sugarcoat things. And I think that people see past a lot of mistakes or errors with the game design or like the representation in order to, because, because the game puts them in that state, mm. right? But I think that if you really want to grow as a game designer, then you really need to face the, face the raw truths sometimes and like sometimes people just like close and delete your game like you need people who are who are so disconnected from you that they are willing to do like give you an awful review because it, it they really think that it's that bad and i think that's when you really learn a lot as a designer i think but i will say that you know we are starting a new project um which is called dive um otter ocean which is going to be our first game that we are self-publishing um and we put that out quite early to do some testing or like to get initial feedback. And even though it's like a kind of idle, sort of idle game, um, we got a lot of feedback, really involved feedback from community members, like really nice. We have like fan art from people. People are like, oh, I love this otter. Like, what's the story? And like more. So my opinion has changed quite a bit. Like um, I've gone from having really personal connections with everybody who plays my game in games like Tacenda. And then I've gone to something more commercial where I'm not really interacting with my audience. And then we've gone a little bit further. And once we put a face to it and make it charming, 
people all of a sudden are a lot more human and personal with the way they can give you feedback again. So it's like, it's a weird roller coaster. I don't think that there's like commercial and like non-commercial anymore. Oh my God, there's I a unicorn just, otter. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's an everything otter. Ah! There's an every <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, I just go. <laughs> yeah, I think it's I think it's more like if people get really into it and they really spend time with it, they're going to give you great feedback. Um, anyway, I, I don't think it has to do with how commercial it is because as long as there's something to love there, if the people keep playing it, I think that they will they're aware of what they love about it and that's worth giving a comment for. It's just that um when you are in a showcase like at EGX or like E3 or something like that, Generally, the more commercial stuff doesn't like the people who are going to those places are like very seasoned veterans of like game design, right? And so the stuff that appeals to them or makes them give good comments or interesting comments is very, in, especially in, uh, include school in that as well. It's very different from the people who don't know who you are, they don't care who you are, they've never met you, and yet they still give you feedback. And as I get more older as a game developer, I kind of feel like that's more honest because they don't even know who I am. Like they're just sending fan mail of things that they like. I, I think that's like really honest. I don't know. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. Uh, it, but... It's really interesting. I remember that when I started uh, working as an indie, working as an indie is a, is a weird thing to say. <laughs> but when, when my career turned more independent, let's put it like that, maybe this makes more sense. Something I love doing was getting in touch with people at game events and taking notes of the games I was playing and sending emails to the developers saying, look, I played your game, you weren't there, those are my feedback. And the vast majority of people I uh, I helped, or you know, I, I brought to, they were really, really happy I did it. Because th mm. it's it wasn't just, I really love the game, it was like, hey, I'm playing this game, I find those issues. I'm a programmer, so I think this is what's going on, uh, <laughs> which I, I love doing. And I think that it's a very good thing for me and for the people because it helped building professional relationships. Some of those people, you know, eventually they became friends or, you know, people I, I'm still in contact with. And you always, always help, you always have a solid network of people that trust you personally and professionally. Um, I love doing the opposite. When I, when I was in my biscuits phase, I had these. I remember one time I was showing one game I made, and I had these um, this panel saying, um, you know, if you play it one biscuit, if you find a bug, it's five or oh, fifty. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. Depends how stressed I was. And for me, showcasing something, it's also a very good opportunity to get play testing. And to get feedback. And especially, as you said, if, if your game needs to appeal to a certain audience, you need to make sure it does appeal to that audience. You cannot risk that not being the case. So the more the harsh feedback you get now, the better feedback you will get when the game actually releases. So I think that it's, in a way, you're just delaying uh, the pain, but eventually you need to get it. And it's better to get it all out as soon as possible and somehow connected to that it's also one thing where i'm very focused when i'm when i'm marking projects a lot of the time students don't submit stuff that works it's not okay but it's sort of okay if they let me know if they have a critical evaluation and they tell me look i submitted this because i had no time whatever but I know it's crap, or I know, well, maybe not like that, but I know this doesn't work because, I know this is bugged because, I know you can't solve this thing because, then I'm like, okay, you haven't fixed it, but I know that you know what's wrong, so potentially you can fix it. It's way worse when people pretend that's terrible, or even, even worse when people don't see what's wrong with their games. And they're like, like the, the worst things I can have in a report is when people write, oh, I think my game perfectly did this. And all my objectives were, you know, they, I managed to get them. And I was like, no, you didn't. 
did you are you lying or you just not seeing that this doesn't work and if you don't see that something doesn't work you can't fix it you can't fix what you don't see so i think it's yeah. super important for people to get real and see what doesn't work in a game and if they don't ask other people and everyone is entitled to their opinion and if they don't like it their opinion is perfectly valid maybe it's not a constructive criticism but get it and it's so bad when people do play testing and they say oh all the people loved it well then probably you didn't play test it enough did you or you ask your mm. mom <laughs> you know I, I think that the reason one one really good reason um to get really okay with that level of like feedback at that point or play testing at that point is because when you get to the point where your games are actually being played like a by a hundred thousand people um there's another jump that you have to make, right? There's number one, there's what you said, being able to see and accept and take in mistakes that you have made or that other people have told you about, right? And then there's the other level, which is something that I'm still trying to work with understanding or like accepting myself, which is people who you don't know have said that this thing is bad, like on a scale of 10,000 or 50,000. And as a designer, your gut is telling you your gut, which has passed the previous phase where you know you are good at identifying and you have your own call and you feel like you've made a good design decision, you're telling your, your body, your gut's telling yourself that this is, everyone is wrong and that you've made the right choice, right? But the reality is that, you know, when 10,000 or 20,000 people are commenting about the same thing or like that they don't interact with this object simply because it's not red, it sounds really stupid, but that is a reality. They're not even giving you feedback. They're just doing the thing that they feel like. And so the reason that I think that if anyone's listening to this, that you should get good at what Alan was talking about is because there's going to be the next jump where there's another thing that you have to let go of in terms of feedback. And at a certain point, you know, when 20,000 or 30,000 people tell you that they don't like this, then you have to just be like, yep, my design sense is wrong. I have to accept that it wasn't a good choice because there's no room for ego when it gets to that point right because there's literally like so many people who you don't know who just don't like the decision that you made um there's there's no ego they're not trying to be mean they're not collectively trying to be mean um, <laughs> maybe not collectively <laughs> maybe individually yes <laughs> it's just it's just like the truth that you have to accept and so i think there's a lot of humbleness to be trained before you can you know, fully release or after you release the game. I think that's part of the process. And I think that makes it hard, but also makes it very interesting to develop yourself. And it's a difference between, you know, being an artist and saying, oh, I made these things because this is what I want to tell. This is the, 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 the meaning I want to give to this piece. This is the interpretation I want to give it. And it's perfect as it is because that was my vision. And there's nothing wrong with that. I've done it with games. You can do it with whatever. But if you want this to be... A job it needs to sell and people are what you know eventually it's their money and it's their decision if they don't like it they're not going to play your game they're not going to give you money so it's important yeah. to negotiate that with yourself what do you want to do do you want this to be a career you will need to make you know compromise or adjustments or negotiation you know whatever words it's uh it, it we decide for if you want it to be a form of art, more than welcome to. But again, when you're making a game, there is also technical execution. And yeah, you know, maybe the mechanic is exactly what you want and is not for everyone. But if the technical execution is bad and if there's a problem you don't see, then it's not people are wrong, this is my vision. It's just not working. If there is a mistake, if there is a bug, that is objective. It's not your decision to make that bug. So as you said, I think the words humble, it's really, I think it's probably really what, what's needed here. You really need to accept the feedback and to welcome the feedback because it's people that are wasting their time to let you know what's wrong with your game. That's such yeah. a, a unique opportunity. For you to learn and i mean you mentioned thirty thousand people doing it i hope it will never happen to me but <laughs> well i mean like um, when we're, we're when we're on the scale of like 10 to thirty thousand, it's more like the stats show that they don't like a thing right they're not sending you personal emails where they're like i don't like the blah 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 
I mean, if 30,000 people all send that email, I think that requires a different level of uh, reaction. <laughs> um, we, we have a question from um, Ahmed Kamal um, asking, do publishers influence the design of games to fit, to fit in monetization? And I think that maybe you briefly think, touched that before. But. Yeah, I think that, um, I think that uh, we've worked with a couple of different publishers now and each different relationship has its own, um, has its own thing. Like with some publishers, they do influence or they do give suggestions or they do help to, they do control like how the game fits with the monetization. But frankly, um, the basics of it are done so far for us, like, we established the basic monetization framework, right? And we wouldn't even have gotten past that. We wouldn't even be working together if we didn't submit something proper for the for the initial guess of how we're going to do the monetization. How it's run at a nuanced like scale, like like how it's actually operated, each publisher has their own way of like coming in, right? Like some of them are super hands-on, like designers, like they help with the design of the bits that would become monetized and they suggest like things that are good gaps in the market or like this is a good price range or like we really need something for people who are playing with like for cooks like we need something for people who are playing with families all of the things that are being sold are only for a single player we think that families are really important they might be super involved but at the same time there might be another group of publishers who are kind of just letting you do your own thing and they're just giving general suggestions like um like we probably need more in-app purchases or we probably need more ads, right? So different publishers will have different relationships in terms of the monetization. But the fact, the initial setup of the monetization really would, it's not realistic to think that they would be the one that you would develop it together. You kind of need to know what you're doing even before you start talking to them. But I will say that I have felt that the relationship with publishers who guide us more on the monetization thing have been more beneficial to me as a developer. I've learned more because frankly, they know more about it than I do. I'm more of a games designer. Um, and when they have good reasons and they teach me why they're making these decisions, I grow more as a designer. So in hindsight, I really like it when they are more involved in the whole monetization and design process because like, we still need them. We still are growing as designers and they know a lot. They've seen a lot. Um, and it gives me like a new texture or design consideration to have, uh, when I'm, when I'm doing the design now, I, I think that I like, if they leave you to your own devices too much, when it fails, it, you know, it, it's a directly a result of your decisions and you don't, you might not really know why, that decision didn't work. But if they made it with you, then, and they're willing to work it through with you, I think you grow a lot more from that. I think a lot of people fear the publisher or the, in, or the investor getting too involved, but I've learned to really welcome it. I think I, I've, I'm a much better designer now because of it. Yeah. Um, if you see me doing faces while you were chatting, is because every time the video loops, I see new details. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, oh my god, I love this game already! And, and I think I was I mentioned well, these. The artist for this game is so strong. Like we just started working with her just before starting this project, and like once she was in it, we were like, holy shit! Like um, this is the perfect person for this if we didn't have this person we wouldn't be able to make this I, I love these already and as I, I think I mentioned it the other day when we were doing the rehearsal for for the show that yeah. um, sometimes I might be watching hours of videos of otters holding hands <laughs> when they sleep so they don't they don't drift away oh my god <laughs> so oh. it's a dream <laughs> come true <laughs> It's so it's so nice to be able to focus on a project now which is primarily art focused. Um, I think this game will not push the boundaries too much in terms of game design and stuff, but really push the boundary of of how we satisfy people with great imagery and great content and great features, right? And it's it's so nice to have like an art style that's immediately attractive. Mm -hmm. Like you haven't even played the game and it's already kind of like pulling you in. Like the um, pirate, he has like a, a, a two. Oh my god, I, I, I'm obsessed. <laughs> you know, like when you when when if you if you when I was in school, like especially like if I'm like a developer who doesn't have a lot of art skills, 
I have to fight with mechanics alone and try to make this project look as appealing and sexy to someone from a mechanic standpoint. That's really hard to do. Like if you only have mechanics to work with, that's really hard to do. So when you land on an art style that is pulling people in, I see that as a great blessing because like then you can kind of like do whatever you want, right? <laughs> like we could make like an RPG game with otters as like wizards <laughs> or something like that. Or you could make, you know, um, it, it opens these doors to let you do crazier things. So I, you know, a great artist is really, really beneficial. I nice, think. nice. So um, in the meantime, if you have any more questions for Jai, feel free to write in the chat and hopefully we can address them. We know we, we can talk a lot, so hopefully we will be able to address everything. But there's one final question from me that I actually want to ask you. And it's the question that I keep asking to all the guests that I, that I had here. And is how many versions of Unity do you have installed on your machine? <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to open it. Oh, God, and I'm gonna kind of, it's crushing everything I'm gonna, now. <laughs> I'm going to kind of, I feel like I should explain myself as well. Um, I don't actually have that much. I have like one, two, three, four, five, five versions of Unity. So that's 2017, 2018, two versions of 2019, of which I think I can delete one because um, we don't probably don't need it anymore, and one in 2020. So I think that we have the 2017 version because we must have started a project like Too Many Cooks or something like that way back when. And changing and updating a project to a new generation is just such a hassle mm. to the point where like we have definitely abandoned cool features from Unity for the sake of not having to update, which feels really bad because every time Unity makes a big, you know, they do like their keynote and they're like, we introduce blah, 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 and blah, blah. You know, blah, I'm blah, not blah, a fan blah, of the keynotes. Be like, well, I'm not using any of that. Yeah. Because I don't want to switch. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not a fan of the keynotes. It's mostly hype. That hides the fact that there's very little substance <laughs> if you look historically most of the stuff that was covering keynotes is dead now so really? yeah. i'm like mm. i mean like i have the 2020 version right now just because i want to play around with their new features you know like trying to teach myself for the next generation of our games so that's why i have the latest version and then everything else is kind of in the middle between 2018 and 2019 where it's like this project was started at this time so it's going to stay 2018 forever and this project was started later, so it's going to be 2019. So I feel like you have one version for every game that you Exactly, have. exactly. Yeah. I feel it like that. <laughs> I have a lot of experiments that I keep doing, you know, for tutorials and stuff. And every time I, I pour this giant project into a new Unity, it breaks some of the old ones, especially with shaders. It's a mess. Oh, my God. Especially when the, with the, the lightweight render pipeline now being added. It's like a lot of stuff. No, 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 no. I have, not, I have not even touched that. Because I know it's really? yeah, yeah. Because um, my experience with some of their new features has been not necessarily positive. Well, I mean, not in a bad way. Not in the sense that those features are necessarily bad, but in the sense that they keep changing some of them, and I appreciate that because it means that they're yeah, yeah. iterating very rapidly. But at the same time, I don't think that there's been much transparency or honesty in some of the workflow. The result is that. I've started working on tutorials for some of the new features and yeah. before I finish them, the things have changed. <laughs> yeah, and, I guess as a content creator. Yeah, and, awesome. and as a creator, I, you know, I can do two things. I can either make super quick, super shallow tutorials and then being able to cover all the features. And I know that some people really do that. For example, um, Brachis is amazing at covering uh, all the new features that come out and every uh, every time there's something new in Unity, I don't even check Unity, I check Brachis because I know it's so good, Asbjorn is so good at yeah. distilling everything and giving, you know, such a nice warm overview and I know that if he's talking about them, he's going to cover them at some time. Um, so I know, I know what's new and that totally works, but at the same time, it does, for me, I cannot do that. Because to do one of my tutorials take weeks or months. So I do not have mm. the, the flexibility to, to, to say, oh, there's a new update. Uh, the, the, the new thing came out yesterday. I can push a video in three days. No, maybe in three months. If I only do, if I start doing now just that, maybe I can do it in three months. And if you need to change your stuff in the meantime, I'm fucked. 
and a lot of and it's it's the reason why I have not covered any of the new features. I still use in Unity, of course. I love Unity. <laughs> I use it every yeah. day. So it's more like a love-hate relationship, but I love Unity. It's my tool of choice. But I'm not going to invest as a creator in features that are going to change mm. so rapidly unless Unity pays me or unless you know Unity sponsors some of the content. I feel like that's the same for us as we're developing a game as well. Like, you know, sometimes we want to rely on a certain feature for a new game. And until things have really stabilized, we simply cannot start the project until things have died down and this feature has solidified and become stable, right? Um, it's basically agreeing with you that like whenever you're doing something for longer than like three to six months, you're going to probably be very wary about trying out any of the new features because like they're not stable. They need to be so stable in implementation mm -hmm. and there needs to be, even if things are getting better, we just don't want any changes if we're in the middle of developing a game for this and it relies on this new system. So, uh, For example, it's one of the reasons why <clears throat> I've wrote three books about shaders and um, I've not written the part that is focused on the new pipelines because I was like, if I write that, sp I mean, they're in the book, someone else wrote that, but I was like, well, how long are they going to survive? And I don't. If if I write something in a book, then that is changed. It's not going to be included in the next book. So so how I'm not even gonna wait. How do you know when you've waited enough? You don't do it. <laughs> you just <laughs> you just no. That that's a thing. Like um, it's a very good question. Right now, you don't because think about the new pipelines. How long have they been in development for? Forever, know. forever. <laughs> and Unity keeps, I won't say breaking, you know, you, you can see that I'm very stressed about this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm personally triggered by this. But Unity keeps iterating on them and they're not finished yet. And even, even when they say they are, they're really not. So I'm probably not going to touch them until Unity has not done any update on them for one year. At least for one cycle of updates, and maybe by the uh, time they're old, year, one year's worth of missed content. <laughs> well, probably, but you know, Unity claim that that's going to be the sort of not final, but sort of stable for that's the direction they want to go. If that's the case, there would be a time when they're not going to publish any more updates for a cycle. That's when I know, okay, it's done. Now I can start focusing <laughs> on them. And there are features where this has, this has happened. For example. Unity has um, work on a 360 feature where you can basically render a scene in 360 degrees. It's not perfect. It's not as nice as I would have, as, as the shader I brought. Let's go with that. Well, I shaded I stole <laughs> <laughs> and adjusted, but it's good. And I've used it for one of my projects and it works like a charm. It's, it's way more efficient than my solution. So I've seen that Unity has not touched that for a few months, I covered it in my tutorial because I know that likely that will stay as it is for years. So, you know, for me personally, that is that is really important. Okay, so that's what you're waiting for. I guess we have to wait for a while to look up for your new tutorials on whatever pipeline is the last <laughs> pipeline. And uh, yeah, well, let's see. You know, I'm, I'm very um, I'm, I'm very harsh on yeah. Unity sometimes, maybe more than I should. But I think that I've had this experience of tutorials breaking in the past. And so much of my time right now is spent adjusting old tutorials. And people don't understand this sometimes. Maybe, maybe, maybe we'll talk during the credits about this, because I know that some people might be, might be interested. But um, <laughs> so let's see. OK, I'm having a final chat, final look at the messages out there. Um, so yeah, I think that we covered most of the questions. So, yeah. Jai, thank you so, so much for being here thank you for with me. me tonight. It was a pleasure, and I was really, really looking forward to, to talk to you because I've, I've had a chance to see you growing professionally so much, and I wish all of my students could follow your trajectory or could be as successful <laughs> oh, and as passionate you. As, oh. as, as you are. And every now and then, David and I were like, oh, we, we, we miss Jai. <laughs> Well, I mean, like, you know, I mean, I'm sure David doesn't say that because, like, I'm literally always at the university. 
<laughs> running around doing stuff like making people test the game or like coming in to give tutorials or crits or stuff like that. So I'm sure David does it, but you haven't seen me in a while. So it's been nice to catch up, especially like I know that you were there at the beginning of TMC and that was really the start of our journey. So it's nice to touch base and kind of reminisce mm -hmm. on the journey that we've been. And I don't even think that we've gotten like to the end or even the midway. No, I hope no. <laughs> we're, 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 like doing each step very, very slowly up. Um, like, so I know there's still a long way to go. <laughs> right? I think it's really good for me because I have a lot of passion for making games, as I said, but not for the marketing side and business side. And so in a way yeah. I see, I see what you're making and it's like, oh, this is what I could have done if I had that drive that I don't have right now. So it's nice. It's, it's also like some students are also like a stargate into alternative universes that could have been my life. If I had <laughs> done that. Universes that you could have done that. Yeah, it, it yeah, is I true. It is true fun. because I, I've decided to go for a different route because it's the one yeah. that I personally enjoy more. But it's nice to see a sort of what if, what if I've continued on that? So it's really nice to see, you know, that possibility going but yeah with that said thank you so so much for being here with me tonight and to all the people that are still watching keep watching because i'm introducing the next guest in one second but that being said thank you so much jai no problem <laughs> thank you very much Alan. thank you have a good night so um i want to spend the last five minutes of the show to introduce the guest that we're going to have next week as you can see it's marina diaz She's a creative designer, amazing creative designer. She's a BAFTA crew member, uh, ops coordinator for Games Aid. It's a charity that raises money for children charities. So it's something really interesting that I hopefully we will talk about next week. And she's also the lead designer for a studio called Je ne sais quoi. And the image you see here, it's from the game um, Dorgonia. Uh, I probably mispronounced it but hopefully marina will tell us how to do it uh, how to do it um next week and you know i've been friend with marina for i've been knowing her for quite a few years and i've also had a chance to invite her to one of the games library night which is the event i run at goldsmith with federico fascia so it will be quite interesting to see what she's been up to since the last time the last time we talked to and as always, I want to thank everyone who has joined me tonight. Uh, it's really a pleasure to see people interacting with the chat. And I see that over time, there is more interaction. It's really nice to see the show growing, not just in numbers, but also in interactions. I think, you know, it really motivates me to keep doing Despite that, it's more work than you expect <laughs> to get everything working smoothly every time. Um, something I mentioned before is that a lot of people don't necessarily understand um, that how I create content and I know that some people would like me to create more content maybe a tutorial a week and I think that there was a time when I was doing that but as I said before this is only working if I can do stuff that it's small and self-contained if I want to make stuff that is larger and I think it's the value I can add then unfortunately there needs to be longer waits in between tutorials. A lot of people are really good at making very short bite-sized tutorials and publishing them really, really rapidly. Like Barkis, Brackis, sorry, sorry. Brackis, as I said before, it's not usually the type of content I create. So please understand if it takes longer for me to create those tutorials and to work on those tutorials. But at the same time, that's another problem. The more content I make, the more maintenance that content need. Because if someone pays, join my Patreon and pays for a tutorial that is, I don't know, three years old, it's probably not going to run on a newer version of Unity. So I constantly have to reply to messages and to fix stuff that Unity is breaking with the new updates or that somehow doesn't work as people intended. So the more content there is, the more maintenance I have to do on that kind of content for the old, but also the new people that are coming for that specific tutorials that I've done one, two, three, four, five years ago. So I hope you understand that even if you don't necessarily see content posted every week, it doesn't mean that I stop working on the content. It just means that there's a lot more that I have to do, you know, in the background that you might not necessarily see. And this, of course, it is possible 
because of the support of people on Patreon. Uh, so it's something I'm very, very grateful for. And as I'm always saying, if there are creators that you want to support, if the stuff you made was made possible, was made thanks to the uh, some of the creators like me or others, then please, please, please support them, especially at a time, in a moment right now, where we might not have the same opportunities. I work in education. A lot of colleges are unfortunately reducing the number of people working there, including Goldsmiths. A lot of people might not have the same opportunities when it comes to contract work because of the pandemic. So this is a very good time to support creators if you have a chance to do so. Now, with that being said, again, thank you so, so much for being here with me tonight, and hopefully I will see you next time. Bye! Thank you.